Welcome to Quality Benchmarks for Executives. I'm Consuelo Mack. The term benchmark in our title has a rich history. In surveying, a benchmark is a critical reference point from which all other points are measured. In quality management, the term benchmark has come to mean the best practices or the best designs. Well, today, we are looking at quality benchmarks for executives, the best management practices for achieving quality. Four diverse companies illustrate the dramatic results achieved by quality leadership. Through in-depth discussions with top executives of four outstanding companies, we are able to identify the crucial activities that you can undertake to obtain similar results. We are going to Schaumburg, Illinois, to the Motorola Company, a 1988 winner of the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award. Motorola has recaptured its electronics market from Japanese competitors. We are speaking with the chairman of Motorola's executive committee, Robert Galvin. We set a goal that was manageable to everyone. Why don't we try to improve by ten times in five years? That's a rather substantial goal. We discovered after about two and a half years we had for the most part achieved that goal. And in Cleveland, Ohio, we'll go to Globe Metallurgical, the first small business to win the National Quality Award, and speak with its president, Arden Sims. We're now selling product into India, into Taiwan, uh, into uh, Korea, into Australia, Malaysia, and into Japan. And in that part of the world, we are competing with the Japanese, and we're, we're winning. Oakland, California is the home of the Kaiser Permanente Foundation, the largest prepaid health care service in the United States. Chief Operating Officer Dr. David Lawrence is using quality to establish a competitive advantage in the health care industry. We see ourselves producing um, the lowest rate of cesarean sections in Northern California hospitals or Southern California hospitals, uh, you know, compared to the, to the community at large. The best outcomes for cardiovascular surgery. Uh, the best outcomes for low birth weight babies. Under the leadership of John Hudeberg, Florida Power and Light became the first non-Japanese company to receive the Deming Medal for Outstanding Quality from the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers. He talks with us during a pause at a national conference on quality. The more significant thing was those uh, improvements we made in uh, meeting our customers' needs. Reducing interruptions from uh, 100 minutes a year to 40, reducing complaints to 20% of what they were, reducing lost time accidents to the lowest in the history of the company, improving nuclear power plant safety and reliability. Finally, at the Duran Institute in Wilton, Connecticut, senior institute staff provide us with some broader perspectives. The Institute's founder, Dr. Joseph Duran, has been one of the world's leading practitioners of quality for over five decades. Dr. Duran emphasizes the historic importance of what these companies have achieved. I think what's happened in the 1980s is that a significant number of companies, such as the Motorola's, the Xerox's, and the like, some of them are Baldrige Award winners, some are not have reached world-class quality and done it within our culture. Now that's a big finding. It's a, uh, something of the greatest moment. It's doable in our culture. During the next half hour, these leaders will be sharing some of the critical steps that top management takes on the road to world-class quality. These actions include creating a quality vision, formulating a strategy and deploying specific actions to make the vision a reality, establishing the organization and resources needed to implement the strategy, using the correct data and information to guide the implementation, and nurturing a corporate culture that supports quality. When you want to achieve truly stunning quality results, just where do you start? Well, you start with a quality vision, a comprehensive view of where you want to be. In our case, it was to be the best managed electric utility company in the United States. We will be recognized in our, in our field as being the leaders, outstanding in the provision of quality, in all those senses of the word quality. Uh, we believe that we can operationally uh, act to the standard of perfection. We can do things without any mistakes, 
and with total satisfaction to our customers. And uh, that total satisfaction involves giving that customer something even more than the customer might have expected. Every leading quality company has a vision. The vision is usually couched in general terms, but it provides a clear indication of the company's intent. Success depends on systematic strategies built on the vision. Well, after some initial successes at Florida Power and Light, management realized a more systematic approach was needed. We started with what we call quality improvement teams. And that's a, a good place to start, I think, not the only way, but uh, we uh, had a lot of teams and we could anecdotally see some progress and some results. But at the corporate level, we could not measure the improvement. It wasn't until we began to put in what I call total quality management, that's what it's come to be called in the United States, uh, that at the corporate level, we could see tremendous improvement in those things that our customers said were important to them. Once your vision is in place, several key steps are required to produce results. You focus first on the customer. What Analyze the customer, interview the customer, find out everything you can about what the customer expects, wants, needs, and desires from your organization. Translate that into uh, areas within your company that you can do for certain things. Set some very aggressive, tenfold improvement goals and things of that sort over some period of time. And then uh, communicate all the way down through the organization. Besides having a plan for reaching their quality vision, leading companies also establish quality criteria as a basis for their overall strategy and integrate quality into their routine business plans. In, in many of our strategic discussions or corporate decision-making discussions, I'm trying to link our decisions back into the, corp the, the, the quality agenda, trying to give it a context, give those decisions a context. Based on its years of experience, Duran Institute has found that it is important to distinguish between strategic goals and the means used to reach them. The top executives make mistakes in terms of strategic quality goal setting. And they think of things like uh, you know, involving employees or training everybody in the organization in a special tool or technique. And these are objectives that really are not strategic quality plans. The objectives might be you know, to reduce defects or errors that the customer sees or to improve the customer satisfaction by providing new features and new products. And the training, if that's, that's what they have in mind, is really a, a means to that end, but in itself is not the objective. Top executives are in general familiar with developing specific strategies and putting them into action. Executives of companies with superior quality extend that process to quality strategies. Implementation of these quality initiatives requires new organizational structures and redirected resources. To make one or two or several improvements, you don't need a structure. But to make improvements by the thousands, you must have a structure. And they have to create that structure. Globe's quality program is managed by two committees. The top management QEC committee, that's quality, efficiency, and cost. And there, I chair that committee. Each of these companies has some form of top executive group leading the quality effort. These quality councils or steering committees of senior managers perform several crucial functions. Dr. Lawrence recalls neglecting one of these functions in the earliest stages of his efforts. But it wasn't until later in the process that we recognized that we really needed to concentrate some effort on deciding how much of an improvement we needed and wanted. We're very reluctant to do top-down planning in an organization like ours, which is very decentralized. Uh, that was a mistake. I think we could have been a little bit more aggressive in that arena. In quality, as in other areas of business, setting priorities keeps the organization moving in the right direction. Quality councils generally set priorities in two major areas. Our decision-making process on what to improve first in our quality program was to find out what did the customer want us to improve. A second type of priority addresses the cost of poor quality. Eliminating all that waste and rework and misdirected efforts and so on uh, produces such vast improvements in efficiencies and effectiveness that uh, 
you get far more back in it financially, tangibly, than you ever spend on it. In short, top management targets those opportunities most important to the customer and those that reduce the cost of poor quality most dramatically. Usually the existing organization and resource allocations are not able to support these priorities. And then they all work together cross-functionally to address even bigger issues that each department alone is unable to uh, implement. And then the CEO has to be able to allocate the resources and focus the resources so that uh, everyone can go out there and do the job that's necessary in order to to get the quality going in the direction it needs to go. Major strides in quality improvement therefore depend on top executives establishing cross-functional teams and giving them adequate resources. And what are some of those resources? We did a lot of training and team leader and facilitator and team member and statistical process control and so on, but top management also needs more training than anyone else. The one most important resource that a CEO can provide is time. Time for people to, to uh, learn what needs to be done, time for people to gather data, to analyze data, to uh, uh, conduct these, uh, these various activities, the team activities that need to be done to add up to continuous improvement within the organization. So quality council meetings, setting priorities based on satisfying customers and reducing the cost of poor quality, establishing cross-functional teams, and providing resources such as training and time for people to do the work. Now you might ask, doesn't all this structure and teamwork slow things down? Uh, we learned uh, during the course of this last dozen years that if we will take an extra set of weeks to define with precision what the design of a whole new product or system is to be, in effect write a contract book of what is totally expected through the entire system for that product to be a uh, designable, manufacturable, producible, and sellable product, we can then design the product and introduce it into production in way less time. Quality leaders have learned that doing things correctly saves both time and money. They also realize that better quality depends on changes in organization and redirection of the company's resources. Vision, strategy, organization, and resources are traditional management tools. Another critical tool is having the right information. Let's place the use of information in context by looking at the experience of yet another company, Xerox. Here you had a new invention that outperformed every method known of how to reproduce documents. So everybody wanted it. And being protected by patents, they had a monopoly and it went on this enormous growth in sales and profits. Now the instruments, on the instrument panel of the top people were financial instruments. And based on those instruments, they were wizards, all-time champions in generating sales and profits. They had no instrument on their instrument panel telling them what is the quality of those things, those machines. Machines broke down regularly, frequently, to the great annoyance of the customers, they couldn't get their reports out, uh, had to wait for the repairman and so forth. Uh, customers are very unhappy. But it didn't appear on the instrument panel of the top people. So it festered, went on and on. It's an example of very intelligent people lacking the information needed to tell them what was going on. What are some examples of the required data? The most important things for any organization to measure are those things that indicate what the customer wants and expects and needs. We need answers to some very specific questions about our customers. Identify what are the quality related attributes that customers say influence the purchase of the product, what's the relative importance of each, and how do customers rank us, and how do customers rank our competition. A lack of such a periodic study to me is an early warning that the company doesn't know where it stands on quality in the marketplace. In addition to knowledge about our customers, we need data on quality within our organization. Do you periodically estimate how, many in, how much in the way of internal dollars you're losing due to scrap, rework, and associated things like that? While cost of poor quality may seem abstract in a service organization, it is very concrete. 
You can sometimes even see the physical evidence of it. Look at a pile of computer output that has just been run and you've got to run it over again. That's scrapped just as surely as a, an appliance that has to be thrown away because it wasn't manufactured properly. Uh, another cost of poor quality, uh, think of a hospital. A patient that has to return to surgery because things didn't, weren't done quite as they should have been the first time. Anytime you do it over again or throw it away, it's a cost of poor quality. And it is almost as tangible in a service organization as it is in a uh, manufacturing one. Besides data on customers and costs of poor quality, one more piece of information is also helpful. Internal culture. What are the attitudes, the behaviors, the beliefs of the employees, the managers uh, within the company? Quality leaders rely on hard evidence about their customers' needs, their own costs of poor quality, and the condition of their organization's quality culture. But obtaining the real facts requires asking the right questions. You absolutely get what you measure, and you have to be very, very careful what you measure, because that's what you're going to get. And one of the mistakes we made you, at Florida Power and Light Company was that in the beginning, we tended frequently to measure activity not quality. We got a lot of activity and very little quality as a result. How do you measure quality and not just activity? Dr. Duran says there is one important step we can take to ensure that our organizations are really making progress on quality. One of the things the upper managers should do is maintain an audit of how the processes of managing for quality are being carried out. Now when you go into an audit, you got three things to do. One is identify what are the questions to which we need answers. That's non-delegable. The upper managers have to participate in identifying those questions. Then you have to put together the information needed to give answers to those questions. That can be delegated, and that's most of the work, collecting and analyzing the data. And then the decisions of what to do in the light of those answers, that's not delegable. That's something the upper managers must participate in. So we need to add to our base of information an audit of the effectiveness of our quality systems. As a complement to data and information, executive leadership for quality requires that we nurture a quality culture. Dr. Duran explains why. The change is actually two changes. There's a technological change of some kind, uh, change in the physical things that we do, uh, the procession of events and the like, that doesn't give people too much trouble. The real troublemaker is something that, a second change that comes in as an uninvited guest. It rides in on the back of this discernible change. And that's the social consequence of the real change. To address those social consequences, top executives practice a style of leadership that may be new for some. Instead of managing, instead of directing, instead of uh, inspecting, if you will, uh, you become very much more of a leader and a teacher and a coach and a model, role model. We've had in the past decades an absolute uh, uh, pouring out of uh, concepts that the upper managers, all they have to do is make the speeches, be present at the uh, big occasions and the like, and uh, exhort by exhortation, get things done, which is a form of uh, delegation to the rest of the organization. It just hasn't worked. Uh, failures uh, have outnumbered the successes by at least 99 to 1. An executive of a quality organization becomes more of a teacher and coach and is personally involved in quality activities. There are many opportunities for personal involvement. Here are just a few examples. The first thing that I did was to go to a lot of classes, and that was a role modelship that all of us had to become as uh, wise as we possibly could in comparison to our counterpart. I personalized it very simply by saying I would like to be as smart and able as Mr. Kobayashi, who runs NEC in Japan, a very distinguished leader of that particular company. If we're going to go into improvement by the thousands, the upper managers are very well advised to be on some improvement projects themselves in order to see what are they asking their people to do. 
How much work is it to be a part of an improvement project? How long does it take? What kind of skills are involved and so forth? Well, I discovered that a certain set of major meetings in the company uh, were putting other subjects ahead of quality on the agenda and thus being short of time to deliberate on the issue of quality. I insisted that the agendas be changed at some inconvenience to myself. And as a consequence, quality is now the first subject on every agenda. In other words, it's the first thing on our mind. When it comes to quality, these executives have been consistent. They have backed up their words with action. John Hudeberg relates one outstanding example of this consistency. I was down at MAC, Military Airlift Command, uh, early in September. Now, they were right in the middle at that point of desert shield, which was the largest military airlift in the history of the world. And the commander of MAC, General Johnson, held a two-day conference on total quality management which he had said was the important thing for Mac to be looking at long range. So right in the middle of a, what is otherwise an emergency, they are not blinking. They're going forward to show that total quality management is still important. One impediment to quality is often the atmosphere of blame that has existed in companies for years. Executive leadership is necessary to change that who's at fault mentality. They have to establish a comfortable rapport between the managers and the workforce so that they trust each other. Uh, abolish the atmosphere of blame. Uh, just get rid of it. Uh, when something isn't right, the attitude has to be, how can we improve this, not who's to blame. Earlier, we discussed the importance of information for gaining significant results. The best data in the world, however, will not help unless the executive leadership shows that the data will be used to make decisions. We're asking those managers to change from always knowing the answer to saying, let's get the, da let's get the data. From getting quick results to staying in it from the long term. And from being the one who makes all the decisions to the one who works in teamwork and enables others to make the decisions. So creating a quality culture requires that leaders become coaches and teachers, are personally involved, are consistent, eliminate the atmosphere of blame, and make their decisions based on the best available data. We have all been through efforts to change organizations with varying degrees of success. Dr. Lawrence and Dr. Duran each suggest some specific actions that will help you transform your company culture. I think it's the concept of, of, of quality uh, and continuous improvement, um, the power of the idea of, of, of giving people the tools to solve their own problems that is creating the cultural shift. I don't think it's the culture that's shifting and then you, you somehow implant uh, CQI onto, uh, onto the culture. You need participation by the people who are going to be impacted, not just in the execution of the plan, but in the planning itself. You have to go slow, uh, no surprises, use test sites in order to uh, get a, uh, an understanding of what are some of these things that are damaged, and then make the mid-course corrections uh, after understanding that. Cultural change is a very complex matter, but these simple guidelines seem to have been important for those who succeeded. First of all, focus on changing actions. Changes in attitudes will follow. Second, make sure employees participate in the changes. And third, take your time. Motivation is part of any internal culture. Within a quality culture, motivation comes from three different sources. The inherent motivation from participation the motivation from being recognized for work done well, and the motivation from financial rewards being tied to quality. The thing that excited our people was uh, achievement, and achievement in the eyes of their customer, achievement in the eyes of their peers. And uh, there's nothing like peer recognition or a customer to tell you that uh, he or she uh, will buy more from uh, the institution. We used all of the communications media inside the company to talk about quality, what our people had done, and recognize outstanding activities. What you're getting is, is a sense of commitment and excitement to the workplace. It's the idea that we're in this as an enterprise trying to create an environment 
I mean, God, we spend 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day working. And the idea that people should be identified with, the, with what it is they do and have an excitement and joy about that is a very powerful idea. If you wanted to be considered for a promotion, you had to understand how to be a leader, a coach, trainer, recognizer, and be, understand how to organize and support your people to do their job. So indirectly there was a uh, reward, financial reward or something attached to it, but not directly. The, uh, then the next thing we did was to implement a profit sharing program for everyone in the company so that they could see the emphasis. They could tie quality improvement to increased business to lower cost to profits. Building motivation within a quality culture requires that executives take three specific actions. Provide for participation, give generous and frequent recognition, and integrate performance and quality with any financial reward process. During the last half hour, leaders of highly successful organizations have identified for us the critical actions that lead to world-class quality. Creating a quality vision, formulating strategy and deploying specific actions to reach that vision, establishing the organization and resources needed to implement the strategy, gathering and using the correct data and information to guide the implementation and nurturing a culture that supports quality. While we hope that these experiences will help you with your own efforts, the importance of what we have discussed is summarized by Dr. Duran. I would go back to some of my uh, experiences with the Japanese CEOs. Uh, I've had a number of them tell me the thing that uh, Bob Galvin will tell you. We don't worry about finances. We don't worry about other things. We worry about quality. We found that if we get the quality right, everything else drops into place. No Japanese CEO told me that back in the 50s, or for that matter, in the 60s. Why do they say it now and they didn't say it then? Again, because they had not seen the miracles. Now, having seen the miracles, they are true believers. And uh, to the extent that I can carry conviction, because I am a true believer, get the quality right. Make it the number one priority. Get it into the business plan. Get the improvements going at a revolutionary pace and stop worrying about anything else. Reaching an agreement on what is meant by quality is not easy. Many meetings to discuss quality just end up in confusion because the same word, quality, has multiple meanings. Quality seems simple and obvious enough, but does the word mean the same thing to everyone? How about your customers? Do you really know what quality means to them? If you look in the dictionary, you'll find about a dozen meanings of the word. But there are two definitions that together define quality. One definition of quality relates to product features. In this classic car, the features are plentiful and sumptuous. Matching burl walnut veneers, exotic leathers, footrests, and a tradition of service that treats the owners of this car like royalty. Product features have a major effect on our revenue because higher quality in this case can result in our ability to charge premium pricing. Under our second definition, quality means freedom from deficiencies, few if any repairs, a finish that doesn't rust, and hassle-free service visits. Freedom from deficiencies has a major impact on reducing our costs because higher quality in this case means less rework, fewer warranty claims, and no customer complaints. Product features and freedom from deficiencies. Together, they're essential in delighting customers. How do you define quality? And how about your customers? Perhaps it's time to agree on a definition. I'm Howland Blackiston of Duran Institute.
For many organizations, there comes a time when the costs of poor quality become intolerable. This Quality Minute tells us about a hospital that was able to end the drip, drip, drip that for years was creating a substantial drain on the organization. These intravenous units are a familiar sight at hospitals. They're filled with customized blends of antibiotics and other medications that doctors special order for their patients. At one hospital, administrators were alarmed to discover that each year, over $100,000 worth of medication wound up dripping not into the arms of patients, but here, down the drain. A quality improvement team flowcharted the process. Each evening, doctors wrote prescriptions which were forwarded to the pharmacy. The next day, the pharmacy blended and filled the prescriptions. The IVs were then delivered to the nursing unit where they were ready to be administered to the patient late that afternoon. So why were over $100,000 worth of medications tossed out each year? By 2 p.m. each day, the pharmacy had completed the process of preparing all of the prescribed IVs for that evening. But sometimes, the physician had discontinued the medication or even discharged the patient. By the time the pharmacy got the word, it was too late. The team's recommendation was simple. Have the pharmacy prepare the IVs two hours later, allowing them time to incorporate each day's late arriving change orders and discharges. The result? The annual cost of wasted medications dropped $87,000. The lesson? When it comes to eliminating the costs of poor quality, there's always time for improvement. I'm Howland Blackiston of Duran Institute. In any organization, there are hidden costs, often the direct result of poor quality. Identifying these opportunities and then improving quality to eliminate the associated costs can be very lucrative. Here's a quality minute where the benefit of taking action on hidden costs was like striking oil. At Shell Brazil, there were sometimes delays in shipping their oil products to customers. Was there a shortage of product? Nope. There was always ample product on hand. So why the delays? A quality improvement team not only discovered the cause of the delays, they also uncovered some costs that have been out of sight for years. Shell sold 15 different lubricating oils, so they stocked 15 different shipping boxes with 15 different labels, each especially designed for one of the 15 products. When a particular box was not available, Shell delayed shipment until that product's box was back in inventory. As a precaution, quantities of each box type were kept on hand. Unfortunately, in Brazil's damaging humidity, the awaiting boxes sometimes had to be scrapped. The team also identified the cost of lost revenues when frustrated customers took their business elsewhere. All in all, these hidden costs added up to $100,000 per year. The team came up with a slick solution. Instead of using 15 different containers, they created a generic box for all of their oil products. They designed cutouts that allowed the contents to be easily seen. The results? Shipments don't get delayed, Shell saves on inventory management, there's no overstocking in that damaging humidity, and the company saves money on labeling boxes, because what you see is what you get. I'm Howlam Blackiston of Duran Institute. Let me start with the assumption that you want quality leadership. That is a safe assumption. So the real question is, how do we go from here to there? What must we do differently from what we have been doing? I'm going to propose some answers on how to go from here to there. These answers are derived from real life experiences. Numerous companies have already been impacted by severe competition in quality, especially from abroad. This competition relates to quality in the sense of customer satisfaction and product saleability. Other companies are severely impacted by quality problems in the form of product deficiencies, failures which create customer dissatisfaction or which create high cost of poor quality. Many companies have tried to regain their quality leadership as to product saleability. 
They have also tried to bring down the cost of poor quality. Some of the companies have made good progress, others have not. We at Durand Institute have received a good deal of feedback from many of those impacted companies. We have analyzed that feedback in order to identify the commonalities. What were the actions which converged to produce good results? What were the roads which led nowhere? My message is really a summary from all that feedback, a summary of the lessons learned. The first of our lessons learned is that most of those failures to make significant progress were due to a poor choice of strategy. As a result, the approach was doomed to failure no matter how well the execution was carried out. Let me explain the nature of that choice. The upper managers of those impacted companies looked over the options which were available to them. These and other options were urged on the managers by advocates, insiders as well as outsiders. The upper managers then made their choice from these options. Within two or three years, many reported that the choice they had made did not pay off. But why did so many companies choose strategies which failed? The main reason is that the upper managers, despite their competence as business managers, lacked adequate working knowledge of how to manage for quality. Lacking this knowledge and pressed for action now, the managers made a choice which seemed reasonable. In the dialect of the marksman, their choice was ready, fire, aim. But they would not have made such a choice had they been adequately grounded in the subject matter. That brings us to the next lesson learned. To make a wise choice of strategy, managers need adequate knowledge of how to manage for quality. The knowledge needed to manage for quality turns out to be surprisingly simple. It consists of just a few fundamental concepts. Once these fundamental concepts are grasped, managers can much more confidently apply their prior experience and training to formulate a sound strategy for quality leadership. Some of these concepts can be derived by analogy, by looking at the concepts which underlie financial management. Financial management makes use of three well-known processes. First, financial planning. This process sets out the business goals develops the actions and resources needed to meet the goals, translates goals and action into money, and summarizes them into the financial budget. Second, financial control. This process goes by such names as cost control, expense control, and so on. Third, financial improvement. This process aims at doing better than the past, it takes such forms as cost reduction, purchase of new facilities to raise productivity, and so on. Managing for quality uses those same three processes. When we apply these three processes to managing for quality, they become quality planning, quality control, quality improvement. The three processes of this quality trilogy interact with each other. It all starts with quality planning, the process of establishing quality goals and developing the means for meeting those goals. Quality planning consists of a rather standardized series of steps as follows. Identify the customers, both external and internal. Determine customer needs. Develop product features which respond to customer needs. Products include both goods and services. Establish goals for those product features. Develop a process to meet the product goals. Prove that the process can meet the product goals under operating conditions. Once planning is complete, the process is turned over to the operating forces. Their job is quality control, to run the process and meet the planned product goals. Let me demonstrate with the help of a visual model. In this model, the horizontal scale is time. 
The vertical scale is quality in the negative sense of percent of product efficiencies or cost of poor quality. What goes up is bad. The quality planning process is at the left hand side of the model. At time zero, operations get underway. It soon becomes evident that product deficiencies abound. In this example, the products produced are deficient in various ways, resulting in a total of 20% deficiency. Why are the products deficient? Most usually, the deficiencies are traceable to the quality planning process. That planning process, for whatever reasons, has resulted in that high level of product deficiencies. In effect, it was planned that way. Under conventional organization structures, the operating forces do not have the responsibility and or the resources needed to replan the processes to get rid of the deficiencies. However, they do have the responsibility for quality control, and that is what they do. In simple language, the job of the operating forces is to maintain whatever quality level has been planned into the process. Their job also includes putting out fires, such as that sporadic spike on the model. Here, product efficiency soars to over 40%. The operating forces take steps to bring the quality level back to around 20%. The third process in the trilogy is quality improvement. In this model, the result of improvement is to reduce the chronic level of deficiencies from the original 20% down to a much lower level. In this case, about 3%. We note here that without exception, the companies which have made great progress toward quality leadership have done so by carrying out a great many quality improvements. These improvements take place project by project and are carried out by a universal improvement process as follows. Identify specific projects for improvement. Organize project teams with responsibility to discover the causes of the deficiencies and develop remedies. Prove that the remedies are effective under operating conditions deal with cultural resistance to remedial change and provide for control to hold the gains. Quality improvement is applicable to all industries, functions and processes. We note that once the planning is complete, there's no clear responsibility for improvement. The operating forces take over, but their job is quality control, not quality improvement. How then have some companies managed to make so many quality improvements? The resounding feedback is that they did it by establishing a new organization structure and new managerial processes specially designed to make extensive improvements in quality. In managing for quality, as in managing for finance, there are certain essential activities which should not be delegated by upper managers. Serve on the Quality Improvement Council. Approve the broad quality goals. Allocate the needed resources. Review progress. Give recognition. Serve on some project teams. A realistic look at those tasks and the purposes behind them leads to the conclusion these tasks should not be delegated. Too much is at stake. Being essential and not being delegable, these tasks should be performed by the upper managers personally. Such are the realities. Our feedbacks have made clear that the most influential factor in successful quality revolutions has been the active participation of upper management. In fact, to our knowledge, every successful quality revolution has included the active participation of upper management. We know of no exceptions. It all adds up to a complex revolution. And the complexity explains why so many efforts have failed. However, there have been enough successes to prove that success is achievable and to show how to go from here to there. 
So good luck. And in the words of a dedicated revolutionary, long live the revolution. Now we turn to the Pareto Principle. Any wide assortment of things is a mixture, consisting of a few things, each of great importance, plus many other things, each of small importance. Any salesperson knows that a relative few clients account for most of the sales. Let's draw two columns. One is for clients. and the other is for sales. The vertical scale is percent. Running from zero to a hundred. What the salesperson knows is that a relative few clients account for most of the sales. We will call these the vital few. And the rest, the trivial many. That was just one example of the principle of the vital few and trivial many. Some decades ago, I identified this principle and I named it after Vilfredo Pareto, an Italian economist who had studied the distribution of wealth and had fitted a mathematical equation to the distribution. We will apply the principle to the distribution of the costs of poor quality. Our first case involves a paper mill which estimated its costs of poor quality. The total came to $907,000. And the biggest item was broke. That amounted to $556,000, or 61% of the total. Broke is paper so bad, it must go back to the beaters for reprocessing. It is obvious that no major reduction in cost is possible without an attack on broke. That's where the money is. Now let's analyze broke based on the types of paper made. The paper mill made 53 types of paper. The broke was not uniformly distributed. The worst type A had 132,000 or 24% of the broke. The next type B had 96,000 or 17% of the broke. A plus B together, 24 plus 17, made 41% cumulative. As we continue to add cumulatively, we see that for the top six types, the cumulative broke came to $448,000, which is 80% of the broke. Notice the economy of analysis. By studying just six product types, which is only 12% of all the types, we are nevertheless attacking 80% of the broke. Now let's go a step further. In this matrix, the horizontal rows are the same six product types which resulted in the $448,000 of the broke. The vertical columns are defect types. The paper mill had many defect types, but they also followed the Pareto principle. Just five of those defect types dominate the contribution to broke. So the matrix shows us the cost of broke for the various combinations of product type and defect type. These combinations follow the Pareto principle. The biggest number in the matrix is $61,000, tearing of product type B. We can visualize a study team looking over this matrix and concluding, look at that $61,000 for tearing of product type B. There's a likely nomination for a project.
Sometimes quality efforts fall short of expectations. Teams work in earnest in their projects, but little progress is made. Often these disappointments are the consequence of teams biting off more than can be chewed. In this segment, Howland provides a pachydermial parallelism. Do you have any idea how to eat an elephant? <coughs> well, of course you never would, but the answer to the question is one bite at a time. Some quality projects are elephant size. They're simply too jumbo to take on all at once. They cover so broad an area of activity that they must be divided up into many bite-sized projects. In such cases, one project team can be assigned to cut up the elephant. Other teams are then assigned to tackle the resulting bite-sized projects. If the carving up doesn't happen, a single team might take years to complete the original jumbo project. So, what are the ideal criteria for project selection? The project should deal with a chronic problem, one which has needed attention for years. The project should be significant. The end result should be clearly beneficial to the organization. The project should be measurable in money as well as technological terms. And finally, the project should be feasible. There should be an excellent likelihood of completion within a few months. The overall guiding criteria for picking a project is to make the greatest improvement with the least effort. And not to bite off more than you can chew. I'm Howlin' Blackiston <coughs> of Jiren Institute. Providing the right training at the right time helps ensure the success of quality projects. And so does choosing project team members whose skills can best contribute to the problem at hand. In this Quality Minute, Howland provides a stellar example of what can happen when this basic guideline is ignored. Five, four, three, two, one. Main engine failed. A disaster on the launch pad. Fortunately, it took place in this simulator. We knew that there was something wrong, but we didn't know what it was. The frustrated group is attending a project team excellence workshop organized by the International Institute of Learning. When they arrived, each participant completed an instrument to determine their own behavioral style. Were they risk takers? Were they persuasive, cooperative, or analytical? For their first mission, the trainers purposely assigned team members to the jobs they were least suited, and they received inadequate and garbled instruction on how to fly a mission. The person that's running mission control the sims director may tell you to start it, then again she may not. The team was doomed from the start. We're gonna die. In the days that followed, team members were reassigned to jobs that did match their unique skills and behavioral styles, and they participated in some out-of-this-world training. We all know the power that teamwork brings to solving quality problems, but assuring team excellence requires that we provide appropriate training and effectively match individual skills to the problem at hand. Touchdown! Discovery, welcome home. <laughs> I'm Howland Blackestein of Duran Institute. Good job. Quality tools are useful in revealing information that can help solve quality problems. But sometimes it's the information that's missing that points to the real solution, as this Quality Minute illustrates. Location plotting is a very useful tool for bringing seemingly random quality problems right down to earth. An historical example of the power of location plots occurred during World War II. Analysts had a perplexing quality problem to solve. Why did some planes crash when hit by enemy fire and others return safely to base, even though they were full of holes? The answer emerged when someone suggested plotting all of the holes on one location plot. 
Upon returning to base, planes were examined carefully and holes were noted on a diagram of the plane. Over time, the plot revealed that the holes were uniformly distributed everywhere. Everywhere, that is, except for a few locations. Why were there no holes in these areas? Actually, there were no holes plotted in these areas because if a plane were hit in these areas, it didn't come back to base. It was the areas on the plot without holes that proved critical. In these locations, vital controls were duplicated. Extra armor plating was strategically installed. As a result, the vulnerability of the planes was reduced substantially. It's a high-flying example of the effectiveness of using analytical tools to target the true source of quality problems. I'm Howland Blackiston of Duran Institute. Good quality planning requires a system of measurement. As the saying goes, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Here's a spicy segment that reminds us that measures can be created for just about anything. You like your food hot and spicy? Well, just how hot do you like it? Nothing's too hot for me. Not very hot. I like it pretty hot. Take this jalapeno pepper. Exactly how hot is it? <laughs> That's hot. That's very hot. Whoa. Oh, that's right. Attaining good quality requires clear communication between you and your customers. Such precision is best achieved when we say it in numbers. This requires creating a system of measurement, a unit of measure, and a sensor. Here's our sensor. Our unit of measurement is expressed in Scoville units. A dried pepper is dissolved in alcohol, diluted in sugar water, and given to a panel of tasters. Sipping increasingly diluted concentrations, the tasters determine the exact point the burn sensation disappears. The hotter the pepper, the more water required, and the higher the score on the Scoville scale. Our jalapeno pepper measures about 4,000 Scoville units. And this is a habanero, the hottest chili pepper in the world. It goes off the scale at 300,000 units. Organizations need quantifiable measures like these to achieve precision and quality. And if we discover there are no existing measures in place, we simply have to cook them up. I'm Howlin' Blackiston. <gasps> In order to get to the root cause of any quality-related problem, you frequently got to keep asking yourself the same question over and over. Why? 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 The Ritz-Carlton hotels pride themselves on dazzling their guests with quality. No opportunity to delight is overlooked, and no detail is too small. In every bathroom, the towels are perfectly folded and arranged so that all the logos align with precision. To get it this perfect takes time and money. According to a quality improvement team at the Ritz-Carlton in Naples, Florida, it took too much of both. Towels already folded by machine in the laundry always had to be refolded by hand to center the logo. To solve the problem, the hotel was prepared to purchase a new machine. But a quality improvement team asked, why wasn't this machine folding towels correctly? Was it one of the machine operators? It wasn't. Maybe the machine did make mistakes. The team tested it and it was absolutely consistent. So why, why, why did every towel have to be refolded by hand? One day I noticed the logo was stitched into the towel off center, so I measured it. Then the team measured the logo placement on every towel. 75% were embroidered off center. So the team modified the logo design and created precise standards for the towel supplier so that all the towels can be machine folded. An improvement which will save the Naples Hotel nearly $30,000 a year in rework. The quality improvement team learned an important lesson. Keep asking why. Never throw in the towel. I'm Howland Blackiston of Duran Institute.
Sometimes the difference between jumping to conclusions and finding creative solutions can be the difference between night and day. To shed some light on the subject, let's spend a quality minute with Howlin Blackiston. In Thomas Jefferson's time, patriots defended our nation's capital from the invading British. More recently, the Park Service had to defend the Jefferson Memorial from invaders of another sort. The stone in this building was crumbling. What could be causing this decay? It turns out that it was actually the frequent washings of the stone that was creating the problem. The reason they washed it so often was because there were so many bird droppings on the building. Then they asked themselves, well, why are there so many birds in the building? There's an abundant food supply. Hundreds and hundreds of little fat spiders. So then they asked themselves, why are there so many spiders? The spiders were attracted by the midges, thousands of tiny little insects. So they asked themselves, why are there so many midges? Every evening at dusk, millions of these midges emerge in a mating frenzy. Also, at the same time every evening, the National Park Service turns on the powerful spotlights that illuminate the monument. Well, the excited midges are attracted to the light. The solution? The Park Service has delayed the daily lighting of the structure to one hour after sunset. The midge population is down 90 percent, they've broken the food chain, and there are less frequent washings. So, make sure you're working with all the information and get to the true root cause of the problem. The results can be literally night and day. For Duran Institute, I'm Howland Blackiston with another Quality Minute. Now, let's look at resistance to change. On the face of it, diagnosis and remedy are technological problems. Once we have found the cause and designed the remedy, the rest should be easy. Just apply the remedy. Instead, we run into another severe obstacle. We call it resistance to change. The resistance comes from various sources. Managers, supervisors, engineers, the union, the workforce. What is common is the puzzling reasons given for the resistance. From a technological standpoint, these reasons are illogical and even senseless. Sometimes the resistance comes from the very people the change is intended to benefit. What is behind all this? When we dig in, we discover we are dealing with two changes, a technological change and a social consequence of the technological change. The social consequence is the troublemaker. It is an uninvited guest which rides in on the back of any technological change. Now let's go back to that question, what threats does this change pose to the cultural pattern? A major input for identifying these threats is members of the society. They give reasons for their resistance. These are a mixture of stated reasons and real reasons, a mixture of noise and signal. For example, early in the 20th century, the railroads changed from coal-burning locomotives to diesels. This was a technological change, but it had a social consequence. It eliminated the need for the locomotive firemen. The firemen put up a savage resistance. Their stated reasons were those of public safety. Their real reasons were clearly the loss of their jobs and status. They enlisted enough support to remain on the job in the diesels. Many present day cases parallel that of the locomotive firemen. A project to improve worker productivity may threaten the jobs of some workers. The threat may apply to the supervisors instead. For example, we are discussing a proposal to train production workers in self-inspection. If successful, the result would be to eliminate the work of seven full-time inspectors. Instead, there would remain two full-time auditors to audit the inspection done by the production workers. Now the supervisor of those full-time inspectors resists the change and offers many plausible reasons. The one reason not offered is this change would make my job less important. Some real reasons are well hidden. The pattern of culture may be so tightly woven that it rejects new truths. It is too difficult to pull out the outworn beliefs. 
During the 14th century, some astronomers contended that contrary to old beliefs, the Earth revolves around the Sun. Their proofs were technologically impressive. Yet the citizenry did not give up their old beliefs. These beliefs had come down from religious books, revered teachers, ancestors. These same beliefs were reinforced by one's own senses. They could see the sun moving around the earth. So the new beliefs could not be accepted. It was too difficult to pull out the old beliefs. It was easier to burn the astronomers. All that talk about cultural patterns is educational, but practical managers want to know what specific actions should we take in order to deal with resistance to change. Rules of the road. Provide participation. Members of the culture should participate both in the planning and the execution of the change. A second rule of the road is to provide enough time for members of the culture to evaluate the merits of the change in relation to the threats and find an accommodation with the advocates of the change. Sometimes the threat is so severe that no accommodation is found during the lifetime of an entire generation. Such was the case with the locomotive firemen and with the earth-centered believers. At one time there were two theories of the nature of light, the corpuscular theory and the wave theory. The corpuscular theory was the most popular. Today, the wave theory dominates. In the words of James Clark Maxwell, we used to believe in the corpuscular theory. Now we believe in the wave theory because all those who believed in the corpuscular theory have died. Clearly, introducing change into a culture is not simple, not like throwing a switch and presto change. Instead, we are dealing with biological processes. They have their own pace, deliberate, majestic. It is well illustrated by the incubation of the chick. It takes 21 days for a hen's egg to hatch out into a chick. Thousands of years ago, it also took 21 days. Some people resent that. No progress. Look at travel. We've gone from the ox cart to jet airplanes. That's progress. But the stupid chicken still takes 21 days. Well, here are some eggs incubating. Why not take a Bunsen burner and apply it? Let's go. So we get hard boiled eggs. Here's a supervisor who resists change. If we apply a Bunsen burner to him, we again get an unexpected result. There are multiple ways to provide time to enable the members of the culture to accommodate to the change. Start small. A small-scale tryout reduces the risks for all concerned. Avoid surprises. A major benefit of the cultural pattern is predictability. A surprise is a shock to predictability a disturber of the peace. And choose the right year for introducing the change. There are also other rules of the road. Omit excess baggage. Don't clutter up the proposals with side issues. We may end up debating the side issues instead of the main subject. Work with the recognized leadership of the culture. The culture has its own leadership, and this is often informal. Convincing the leadership is a long step toward convincing the culture. Treat the people with dignity. The classic case was that of the relay assemblers in the Hawthorne experiments. Their productivity kept rising under good illumination or poor because in the laboratory they were being treated with dignity. Reverse the positions. Use role playing to bring out what would be my position if I were a member of the culture. Deal directly with the resistance. There are various options. Try persuasion. Or offer a quid pro quo, some concession in return for some acceptance. Or change the proposals so as to meet specific objections. Or change the social climate so as to make the proposal more acceptable. 
or forget it. No company is able to get 100% of its proposals adopted.